way to get your question answered. Um, Dennis Tavernetti is our host today and he will have saved time at the end with the speakers to answer your questions. So as you think of a question, go ahead and put it in the chat so you don't forget it. And um, they will address those at the end. And I will hand it over to Dennis to introduce our speakers. Okay. Um, I'm your moderator as, as we just heard. And um, this afternoon we're, we're fortunate really um, to have a prime example of one of the latest trends in fine, fine dining restaurants, uh, which champion the practice of the new culinary art form uh, of farm to table. Um, the participants today uh, are the leadership and founders of Topsoil Kitchen uh, and Market, which is in Traveler's Rest and which has a lucky happenstance to uh, front on, on Main Street and back on uh, to the Swamp Rabbit uh, Trail um, with the exceptionally large screen porch as well as uh, a large uh, internal dining space that you'll partially see uh, when we um, get them to, to talk um, as well. Um, please mute your mics if they're not already muted. Um, use a chat function that Nancy just talked talk to you about. I'll collect your, your um, questions and moderate them uh, consolidate them, moderate them at the end, the last last 10, 10 minutes. First up for me to introduce uh, is Patrick McInerney, uh, one of three founders of, uh, of Topsoil. Um, and uh, sitting next to him, you can probably see, is, is Wendy, and he'll introduce Wendy, as well as the executive chef, Adam, who won't be here today uh, during Patrick's uh, talk. Um, a little background on Patrick, and he'll do Wendy's background and, and Adam's background, but um, Patrick's family have lived in, in Greenville on the east side for over 30 years that I've been here, um, and his mom actually is, is pretty well known as the best sweet goods baker um, <laughs> and, and decorator in town, and I understand she recently just turned uh, professional by spending a zillion dollars on uh, building a professional uh, kitchen. Uh, as well, and occasionally some of her goods are, I think, are are offered as as well at, at the restaurant. So I suspect that Patrick's had um, the restaurant food DNA in his in his realm for a number of years, although he didn't act on it until just recently. Um, after high school in Greenville, um, he attended Boston University um, and graduated, and went on to the great the great city, New York City, and worked at. Uh, BBDO, which if you don't know, uh, has um, um, 289 uh, advertising agencies in 81 countries. Uh, and he was creative there as well. And a creative role was uh, as a copywriter. And he was there for a few years, uh, writing illuminating words, I'm sure. Um, and then uh, went on to freelance for several more years. And then, lo and behold, returned to Greenville, um, where his foodie genes finally kicked in, I guess. And he founded Due South uh, Coffee Roasters um, in uh, Taylor's renovated um, historic mill. Um, recently, uh, along with Wendy and Adam, um, they took on Williams or Martha's Hardware, as you might know it of, of, of redoing it and launching a new idea for a restaurant in uh, greater, greater Greenville. So without further ado, here is Patrick. Thank you, Dennis. I'm here with Wendy Lynham, my partner. Uh, we started Topsoil in September of last year, 2000, no, 19. Yeah, it's been a year and a half. It's been a weird year, so we're trying to yeah. play catch up. Um, but yeah, I, so I, I'm from Greenville originally. I'm glad to be back. I was glad to leave after high school, but I'm very glad to be back now. Um, Do South was my first foray into my own business, and I uh, learned a lot in that process. And as Dennis said, we started at Taylor's Mill. We moved from Taylor's Mill to Hampton Station, uh, and in that process, uh, I built a kitchen in the coffee shop, but I didn't have a plan for a chef. Uh, I put a post out online, and lo and behold, Adam uh, answered it, um, and I hadn't seen him in years. Let me back up for a second. Um, Adam, I met uh, at Restaurant 17, so Adam uh, grew up uh, in Montana, and he went to culinary school and then worked his way up to executive chef at Blackberry Farm in Tennessee. 
Uh, then George Hincapie with restaurant seven, with uh, Hotel Del Mystique brought Adam in to open up Restaurant 17. And that's where we met. Mm-hmm. I was trying to sell him coffee and we became fast friends and always had crazy ideas, but never really brought them to fruition. Um, so that by happenstance, I was building a kitchen. Adam was moving back and I didn't know that. And so we started a breakfast and lunch concept um, at Hampton Station. Um, we didn't get enough traffic to support the idea. So we had to be creative. Um, and so we thought about what we wanted to do and what we wanted to transfer, you know, our partnership into. And so we started a topsoil supper club, uh, which was a completely plant-based supper club where we had chef, sommelier, coffee professional and farmer at every dinner. So we could connect people with their food. Um, let's rewind a couple of years. I met Wendy mm-hmm. at, um, well, first I'm going to introduce Wendy. Can you give a little bit about your background? Sure. My name is Wendy Lynham and I'm one of the founders of topsoil kitchen market and Um, I saw the value of the Swamp Rabbit Trail as a recreational trail, just as a user of it, um, when it first opened. And I would ride my bike and come up to the cafe at Williams Hardware and have lunch for years. Um, Got to know the, the sisters who owned this, became friends with them. Then I was inspired myself to open a business along the Swamp Rabbit Trail, and I created the Swamp Rabbit Inn in the west end of Greenville. I didn't know if it was going to work. It was um, it was seven years ago. I opened it in June of 2014 after about nine months of renovating a six-bedroom house. And I just thought I would cater to people coming to the area to ride the Swamp Rabbit Trail. It had easy access to the trail and easy access to downtown Greenville. So it turned out to be a good idea. And then another um, building in Traveler's Rest or a current bed and breakfast in Traveler's Rest became available and the owner had mentored me actually. She, Mary Ellen had, had reached out to me right when I opened and said, come on up, look around, let's talk. And we got to be friends. And uh, then she wanted to sell. So she, um, she offered it to me and I took that one on too. So I I really became ingrained in the business community in Traveler's Rest. And then I connected both ends of the trail with lodging options. So it was a really fun project. And, um, And then I got to know Patrick. He came to an event I would have downtown called Truck In Tuesday. I had a food truck and a band. Local music is something that I really um, support. And so we connected at um, Truck In Tuesday at the Swamp Private End and just kind of kept in touch for years. And then bumped into him when he was upfitting due south at Hampton Station. And kind of that's where the story starts again <laughs> yeah so then about that time um adam and i were starting topsoil supper club an underground supper club um wendy and i started hanging out a lot and we were um both kind of pulled the farm and wendy had 16 acres has 16 acres um uh, right off of the swamp rabbit trail that uh, she dreamed of turning into a farm and it checked my boxes too so we started that project uh, at the same time as topsoil supper club the two are completely unrelated um but as, as we went on with the whole program, they just, they naturally fit one another and Topsoil evolved. Um, it's, it's been an evolution from the beginning, but uh, really Wendy kind of put the gas on the fire to make this thing turn into what it is. Um, and then the, uh, the hardware store became available, the cafe became available. Um, the next day, Adam and I were up here uh, meeting with Nancy with absolutely no idea how we would do it. Um, and we talked with Wendy and it's just all the stars aligned just it felt right and uh so we decided to to take a swing at it um so then topsoil supper club turned into a full-scale restaurant uh and we tended to be breakfast and lunch but this whole thing's been an evolution it's evolved and this continues to evolve especially with this past year um but it's been an amazing experience uh and we've we've learned a lot in the process and we're, we're thrilled to share this story with you guys um and and talk about farm to table and what it means and why we were pulled to do it, why this was important to us. Um, and so, why we're called topsoil. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people, I have no restaurant experience. A lot of people like we'll hear them going by on the trail and they'll say, a restaurant called topsoil. What? So <laughs> there is 
there is a reason that we're called topsoil. And Patrick, maybe you can explain that. And sure. then it kind of leads into our farming practices and and then really our main uh, mission, which is to support local farmers. Yes. Yeah. And that's it. You know, our, our real mission is to connect people to their food um, and where their food comes from and how it grows. And so the name topsoil, while most people wouldn't name a restaurant after dirt, um, we felt that it's an important part of the story that, you know, the quality of where your food grows is in direct correlation with the quality of the food that you prepare. So we are very intentional with our sourcing. Um, farm to table is we live this and breathe this. Uh, and we, we don't do it the easy way um, by choice, but we end up with a better product. Uh, it's really informed all of our decisions and everything we do. We try to connect back to the farmers uh, that we work with, uh, including our own farm, which Wendy and I have built up to uh, pretty, a pretty impressive farm yeah. for two people with no farming experience yeah. and no restaurant experience. So. And we started by getting chickens. <laughs> that was our first foray into starting our farm. And our animals actually work the farm with us. So first we got four chickens and then, um, then we got three pigs or how many yeah. pigs we three little pigs and uh, then we have some goats and um, the pigs actually dug up the lawn. We started with a lawn, an area of what, about a quarter yeah. acre? Yeah, I've actually, I've got a few pictures yeah. that we can see if pull this up. We wanted to do no-till farming. So we set up some pigs uh, with an electric fence and some shelter and just wanted to see what they could do. So they're very um, industrious. And when they are on new grass, they just dig it up and they do the tilling for us. So it was just kind of cool to watch them do their thing. And then we decided to get some goats because they would, um, first the goats would eat the grass and the pigs would till it up. And then the chickens would go after the pigs and they would, you know, dig a little deeper and scratch some of the grass that was left behind. So, I mean, they did a great job. And then a few months um, of the animals working the land, we, what did we do? We got some compost we from Atlas, Atlas Organics. Organics. Yep. And just, it, we like got our friends to help us. Like, oh, this is fun. Come on guys, come help us. So uh, we met more farmers doing this. Um, tell them about the post that you put out. On Facebook. Which one was that? With the broad pork. Oh yeah, so we met one of our um, our friends. All the farmers we work with have become really close friends and um, my granddad was a farmer and I always heard that there's no secrets amongst farmers and it's it's very very true. Um, these have been become some of our very closest friends uh, but what when he was referencing uh, when we started out we we're looking to do no-till so we want to use a broad fork which is a manual device, it's, imagine like it's a large fork you can stand on, two hands, you pull it to actually move the earth underneath. So uh, we didn't have one and we couldn't find one locally. So I put a post out on a Facebook Upstate Farmers page and within minutes, someone uh, named Sweet Tea Dormany uh, said, yes, I got one, come pick it up. So went over to Sweet Tea's house, uh, just a mile down the road and one of the most interesting people I've ever met. Um, he went to MIT, he's got, I think, four or five kids, and he's got a full-on market garden out back that's at two acres, would you say? Like mm -hmm. six hoop houses, like an incredibly impressive. impressive effort. And he's got a full-time job as a software engineer. Um, so just a really diverse group of people that, you know, choose to get their hands in the dirt. And uh, that was a really kind of a special way to connect. And we've been working with Sweet Tea Scents along with, you know, a handful of the farmers that have become really close friends of ours and mentors, really. Like we, we learn from farmers and from YouTube how to do what we're doing. Um, we had no experience in either one of these realms. And, so. yep. and we've been really fortunate that um, some of our customers and guests here at the restaurant have raised their hand and we um, have expressed an interest in helping us on the farm. So we um, had two volunteer days last season um, Thursdays and Saturdays, and we had a calendar where people could sign up. And I mean, on every, any given day, we would have two to five people helping us, which, yeah. which was absolutely amazing. I mean, yeah. we, we accomplished harvesting, planting, weeding, and it's just, it was a wonderful way to get to know people better. And again, build that community around um, farming and the restaurant. And I mean, TR is just such a 
a natural community. It's like, you know, Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. In fact, one of our farmers just stopped by. Yeah. So actually, <laughs> we'll hey, introduce hey, Craig, him. Yeah. Pop in for a second. Yeah, it's, it's so pretty fun. This is our good friend, Craig Weiner. Uh, he <laughs> was Broken Oak Organics, now Stage 22 Farms. <laughs> How you guys doing? Let him pop in for a second, tell you a little bit about uh, his operation, and we've known each other for how long now? Five years? Yeah. Right. yeah. Um, to let you, you've All got right. the floor. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm Craig Weiner. Um, I run Stage 22 Farms uh, in Marietta, South Carolina. It's about 15 minutes north of, uh, 20 minutes north of Furman. Uh, and we are working with uh, Stage, uh, sorry, with Hotel Domestique um, and Restaurant 17. Uh, and they've always been a very strong supporter uh, when I used to be Broken Oak Organics uh, for the last 10 years or so. Before that, it was the Cliffs Farm. Uh, and they've always supported us. Uh, kind of a, definitely a farm-to-table restaurant. Uh, we grow mainly for, uh, for their restaurant. Uh, most, of our, most of our food goes to just a handful of restaurants, Topsoil being one of them. Uh, and Chef Adam Cook has always been, uh, I've known him for about five years as well. And he's been one of my biggest supporters. Uh, basically, a little bit about myself. Um, I started farming. Uh, I started out landscaping uh, when I first moved to South Carolina from Colorado in 2099. Uh, 1999. <laughs> Sorry. It's the time track. Wait, wait a second. Uh, and we... Uh, I realized that I love plants, but I didn't love the whole landscaping business. Uh, so I went back to college uh, at Clemson University for horticulture. And that's where I learned the, the science behind growing plants. Uh, and probably in a little bit more detail than I wanted to. Uh, but I graduated in 2006 and heard that the Cliffs Organic Farm was starting up. And so I went and got a job as a laborer there. And within a year, I was uh, promoted to the farm manager. And then when they did their restructuring in uh, 2008, uh, that's when I took over. Uh, Jim Anthony, the owner of the Cliffs, basically uh, gave me a real cheap uh, lease on the land, and I was able to start my own business. Uh, so we ran Broken Oak uh, till just about last year, this time last year, when I got the opportunity to start this new farm, uh, Stage 22. Up the road. And fortunately, it's about a mile and a half from my old farm, so... I was able to just drive the tractor over there and uh, start the next day. It's, it's a beautiful farm. And you have a, a market every Wednesday? We do. Right? We have a, a farm stand that we set up. Whatever's coming out of the field that week goes on the table uh, for retail sale. Uh, we do that pretty much uh, every single Wednesday throughout the year. What time? It's from 1.30 to 4.30. And where is your farm located? What's the address? We are at 280 River Road. In the, that's Marietta. It's Make about sure it's about fifteen Marietta. minutes from here. Yeah, and it's it's right near Hotel Domestique. So yeah. check out the farm stand. <laughs> awesome. Everything we grow is uh, we're not certified organic, but we use the, the organic practice methods, uh, and basically that's because I don't like chemicals, and uh, that's why I'm organic farmer. Um, I don't think we should be putting that stuff in our in our bodies. And as a farmer, I don't want to be spraying that stuff. It's probably even worse because you're directly in contact with it. And with compost, like you use compost, we, like a lot of the farmers that we buy from, we all are using the compost created from Atlas Organics. And I mean, it really, it really helps the food grow. And um, it's just, it's not necessary to use, to use any chemicals to make, to have a successful growing season. Awesome. <laughs> so, yeah. Thanks, Craig. Yeah, Absolutely. thanks for stopping by. Absolutely. I'll <laughs> see you. <laughs> Chef Adam Cook. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you guys. Have a good good to see you. Thank you all. All right. So, and this this is a, the same case with pretty much all the farmers we work with. You know, most people are not certified organic um, just because of the hoops you have to jump through and the costs involved. But we know their growing practices. We've been in their fields. We've helped them out. They've helped us out. It's a it's a great community. Um, but being aware of where your food comes from is probably kind of the benchmark of what we do. Um, so we we go to lengths to make sure that we know where everything comes from. Um, to that end, I'm going to share with you guys real quick kind of uh, our mission and our motto, which drives everything that we do. Um, hold one second. All right. 
That's my niece. So, our mission at Topsoil is to inspire healthier communities by connecting people to real food. We know our restaurant's a vital link between small farmers and the community, and we feel a responsibility to protect and grow our local food supply. Our motto is plant forward, protein particular. And this is our promise to our community that we are intentional with every decision on their plate. The sustainability of small farms is vital to our health and our communities, and our decisions to support them as a restaurant are crucial. So these are kind of our guiding principles um, that whenever we make any decisions as to, uh, you know, do we want to add this? Do we want to do this? We, we go back and we make sure that it falls in line with our mission and our motto. It's very important to us um, in being a true farm to table restaurant. Um, and then to get into farm to table, which was the topic of the discussion, um, Dennis asked some great questions and love to cover those. Uh, first off, what is farm to table? Um, you know, I think it's, it's knowing where your food comes from. It's knowing who grew your food and it's supporting the people that do it the right way with careful consideration of sustainability in their practices. Um, Dennis also asked, is it better? I think the short answer is yes. Yes, just like um, with wine, the terroir, you know, you taste the flavor. First of all, it tastes better usually um, if it's grown in soil that um, it's healthy. is healthy and it's alive. Yeah, alive. So it affects the taste and the quality as well as the uh, nutritional density of the ingredients. Yeah, absolutely. And it supports your local economy and overall it tastes better in our opinion. Um, and you know, how does it work? Really? It's, it's the relationships between chefs and farmers. Um, and that's where I think that we excel is the strength of our relationships with our farmers and the farming practices that we practice ourselves. Um, you know, our menus all begin as Craig was saying, as the phone Adam, like our menus all begin with phone calls to farmers. Um, it, it doesn't work in reverse. It, it's always what's coming out of the field dictates what goes in the menu, never the other way. And it's Tuesday. So Probably it's still in the field at this point. Yep. What's going to be on our menu this weekend has not yet been harvested or picked. Yeah. So, you know, it's not traveling far. And that, again, helps with the nutrition, nutritional density of the ingredients and the taste of the ingredients. And it's funny, on Saturday, we ate uh, dinner with Craig here. And he actually <laughs> picked out one of the radishes and said, I picked this thing yesterday. <laughs> and it was true. He did. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it's really lovely for us to be able to have that relationship with our farmers and share that with our customers and really connect people to their food in a meaningful way. It's, that's really kind of the, the hallmark of what we do, I think. And, yeah. And even with our wine program, um, you know, kind of our, what informs our decisions is the farming practices sure. of, of the winemakers as well. Another great question from Dennis was, where can you experience Farm to Table? Um, we have a list here that we'd love to share with you guys. Uh, it's, we have actually a very unique uh, opportunity here in Greenville. There are five restaurants that have farms and uh, either started as farms and became restaurants or vice versa. Um, but we'd love for you guys to check out all of them. Um, they're doing things the hard way and they're doing a, a lovely job. It's, it's really, we're, we're proud to call them peers um, in the restaurant industry here in the upstate. Um, so in addition to ourselves, uh, Restaurant 17, which Craig was referencing earlier, just about 50 minutes up the road, uh, they have Stage 22 Farm, which Craig is overseeing, um, Anchorage in the Village of West Greenville. Uh, they have their uh, adjoining farm, Horseshoe Farms, which is up here as well, just around the corner. Uh, Fork and Plow, which is on East North Street, uh, they were started by Greenbrier Farms in Easley. And then Oak Hill Cafe, which is on the way up here from Greenville on Poinsett, they have an adjoining um, permaculture farm right behind the restaurant. Um, so to have that many restaurants with farms in one region, is just, it, it really stands out to me and I haven't seen that anywhere else. I think it's a, a very special offering that we need to support here in the upstate. Um, in addition to that, there's three other restaurants I would highly recommend, Bacon Brothers, Stella's and gb &D for their sourcing practices. Um, so that would be, I think our list of places that, that we like to frequent and we really appreciate the the work that goes into the product that they put out. Um, with that, we'd love to give you guys a short farm tour. So if you bear with me for one second.
Welcome to Topsail Farm. Let's take a look around. We're on about 16 acres right here off Roford Road. Most of it is wooded or pasture land, but we do have about an acre of it planted. Behind me, you'll notice our beautiful carport, which we've turned into a chicken coop. You'll see that we just enclosed it with chicken wire and then added these nesting boxes to the end so we can collect eggs in the morning and keep them safe at night. I'd like to introduce you to our soil management team. In here, we have Florence and the machines, Kate Spade and Tilly. And then over here, is their boyfriend, Herbie Hamhock. And Herbie loves belly rubs. Right. Hey, Florence. So before we planted the field, we actually had the pigs and the chickens run over the soil first. So the pigs would go first and they'd dig everything up and root around and fertilize. Then the chickens would follow and break up all that rich, rich fertilizer and prep our beds for when we started to do our first planting. And since then, we've been no-till, pretty much. Um, we add compost each season, uh, but really the animals did the work for us in really enriching the soil, and the soil is the most important part to delicious produce. Now, these are American guinea hogs. American guinea hogs are prized by homesteaders for their really docile nature. They uh, also can ward off snakes. They will eat snakes and they're really gentle around kids. These guys also can pretty much feed themselves. We do supplement their diet, uh, but they do have a very uh, diverse natural habitat out here where they can forage. And we've seeded the next pasture for them so they have natural forage and minimizes our need to feed them extra food. And now the pigs move around from spot to spot. So they moved here yesterday. In a couple days, they'll move over here. And you can see that we've just spread uh, some rye seed a couple weeks ago, it's starting to pop up. So we're trying to build up their natural food supply as we move them around and enrich the soil, trying to have a more regenerative effect throughout the farm. All the animals here serve a purpose. So we started out with the pigs and the chickens to enrich the soil before we planted. Uh, the pigs are now going in succession through the woods as we start to clear some of that land and then add some natural forage for them. The turkeys, well, their purpose has changed. They become buddies and so Tom and Tom are going to stick around. Uh, the chickens, which are everywhere, uh, we, they have an incredible naturally foraged diet, uh, so the, their eggs taste delicious. Um, so we use those at the restaurant. We also sell them at the roadside sometimes when we have extras. And the goats, we've come to love them, um, but we do do goat yoga with the babies at times, and otherwise they're pretty much just pets as well. Let's meet the goats. So our first goat, Cupid, we got on Valentine's Day two years ago, and then Mary Jane, we got in April, and then this is Mary Jane's third litter she's had. This is Stills, and that's Nash. Her first litter was Hall & Oates, and her second litter was Simone and Garfunkel. And chilling up here is Strons, acting shy. Thank you, buddy. Almost forgot. In addition to Tom and Tom, we also have Jerry. And she's sitting on about 20 eggs right now. So we should have a bunch of baby turkeys here before long. Oh, hello. No farm is complete without a barn cat. This is Linus. Here's another fun farm fact. Right before we started our first season, this tree fell during the freak snowstorm and it has become the giving tree. All the posts surrounding presently are from the branches. We've got other posts beneath the magnolia we're using for future projects. It's been a great place for goats to hang out and humans alike for sunsets. Let's get a better look at the field from a different vantage point. This is the newer field, and you can see where it connects to the older. This is the original half of the field that we planted for our first season. We have 22 rows, about 50 feet long. In our first go, we just did a different variety of produce in every row to see how we did. 
and we've refined our processes year over year and we're going to plant a lot less variety this year and do it better. This half of the field is going into its second season. So we've had it covered for a few weeks now. Uh, George DeBose from Reed River Farms is helping us prep the beds and we'll start planting probably next week. And that's a quick tour of our farm. Keep an eye out for volunteer days coming up in the next few weeks after we start planting. All right, that's a quick tour of the farm. Um, our, uh, you know, we started as a plant-based supper club and that tradition continues to this day. We have a monthly plant-based supper club where we feature a new farmer every month. Uh, we've been doing that since we opened the opened and reopened the restaurant, I guess. Um, but th this month we have a very exciting dinner. Uh, we're going to have Nat Bradford join us from Sumter, South Carolina. Uh, he's a, a very, very well-known farmer. Um, if you're not familiar with Bradford watermelons, I would uh, encourage you to look them up. It's uh, quite a story. Um, we've got another little video for you guys to take a look at. Oh, one more thing, we have guest chef John Buck joining us as well. Um, who was the 2019 James Beard nominee from Greenville for Best Chef Southeast when he was at Husk. Um, so we're thrilled to have both chefs with both the James Beard nominations and uh, a world famous farmer join us on March 10th. So bear with me for one moment. I'm with Nat Bradford, uh, who you've probably heard of. Uh, if not, uh, please join us for our plant-based dinner um, the 10th of March. Uh, we're going to have guest chef John Buck. Uh, they've been working on a lot of cool projects. I'm excited to have them here in our kitchen uh, together, and uh, you're really going to get an education out of this one. I'll let Nat tell you a little bit about himself. Farmer out of Sumter, South Carolina. We've got some really cool crops that we're going to be bringing up and can't wait to see what Adam and John do with them for your enjoyment. Look to see you there. So we'd love for you guys to join us on the 10th, if you're able. Um, tickets are on Eventbrite. Uh, you can also find them on our social media. If you're not following us, we'd love for you guys to stay in the loop. What's going on? We're on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, we have a weekly email list as well, if you'd like to join that. It's on our website, which is topsoilrestaurant.com. Uh, with that, we'd love to give you a quick tour of the restaurant. So I'm going to grab the iPad, switch the camera, and Wendy's going to give you a walk around. Hi, everybody. Okay, so if you haven't been to Topsoil Kitchen and Market, Market welcome. Um, we are very fortunate to have this historic building in downtown Traveler's Rest with, with such good bones. It was a hardware store back in the 1940s, and it was on the Swamp Brevet Railroad track. So we have Main Street TR in front here, and we have the Swamp Rabbit Trail in our backyard. So that's um, a really cool thing. If you look at our bar, we try to preserve some of the history of a lot of the history of this building. It's a really unique building. But we also walked across the trail and found some old rails from the <laughs> Swamp Rabbit Railroad um, just in the woods and asked if we could use them. So that is our bar rail. So when you uh, sit at our bar, look down and you'll see some history from the Swamp Rabbit Railroad. Um, we also maintained the original market counter from the hardware store. We just moved it over here. And this is, this is our market area. And so the counter we resurfaced, but this is the original counter from the hardware store. If you look up, you can see the rough hewn beams. 
um, this is original and the sisters exposed those beams and it's just a really beautiful architectural feature of this building. Um, then the shelf over here as well, where we have our wine is original to the hardware store. So in our dining room- What's that on the shelf over there? Uh, right there. So Dennis was talking about Patrick's mom and her um, sweet and culinary abilities. And she made us a gingerbread house of our barn. It's a complete replica of our barn <laughs> and all of our little animals. And uh, that we treasure that. That's, um, that's a show piece we have here in the restaurant. Um, if you want to follow me uh, back to the outdoor space, uh, we'll be walking through the dining room. And uh, this is our bar. We have a chef's tasting menu every Sunday night, which is uh, like a trust ball menu. And Chef Adam Cook and his team creates a beautiful menu for you, five courses with wine tastings optional. A lot of our regulars like to sit at the bar and watch the kitchen work. And Adam pops out and talks about the dishes as well. It's a different menu every week. Yeah, so we encourage you to join us for that dining experience. Now we're gonna head out to the patio we have two covered porches and this year we were fortunate enough to receive some of the cares at grant money from Greenville County and we enclosed this porch and installed some heaters uh, Buchanan propane a local TR business installed those for us and then the trail if we walk up this way is right here And this is our outdoor patio. This space is available for rent as an event space as well. Um, this is not screened in, it's just an open air patio and it overlooks the Swamp Rabbit Trail. And we have a beautiful cutting flower garden that the TR Beautification Committee installed years ago. And we also plant some herbs down there for use in the bar and the restaurant. So come on back inside and we'll tell you a little bit about um, some of the things we did to get through COVID, including planted. On our way, I wanna point out this new piece of art that we've just added from Jerry Woodman, who is a professor at Furman as well. We love his work. We've got a large piece up front as well. Um, He's got a lot hanging at Due South as well. If you want to check out his work, but Jerry Woodman is our, our guy. This table we are absolutely in love with, weighs about a thousand pounds. This was actually modeled after um, some laminated beams that we found over at Hampton Station. Um, and we worked with uh, Circles and Squares and Tree Hugger Customs to create this massive thousand pound beast that goes nowhere. It took two pallet jacks to get it in here. So it's uh, one of our favorite pieces. And another point of pride for us is an award that we just recently were bestowed. We received a plushie from Off the Grid, off the grid Greenville, yep. Greenville, and it's for our bathrooms. We were voted the most farm to toilet bathrooms <laughs> in the upstate. So we'll show you why. Behind door number one. So this is one of our bathrooms. Look carefully at the vegetable. We'll fill you in on the pun. That's in our garden. This one is in Greedy River Farms garden. Right here we have a leak. So what was the other one? It, it was a pee. Oh, so taking a leak, taking a pee. Yeah. Huh, yeah. Got it. And then let's talk about planted real okay quick. and then what one of the things that uh, COVID actually was kind of a blessing for us in a way it gave us time to uh, start a new income stream for the restaurant which is really we've, we've learned it's really good to have multiple income streams um, to weather weather time so we started um, a plant-based meal program and Patrick you want to tell a little bit more about Planted? Yeah, sure. So Planted is a chef-prepared, plant-based meal prep program. You can choose three, five, or seven meals a week. Orders in by Thursday. 
and then we have meals ready for you Sunday or Monday for pickup here at the restaurant or at Community Tap on Wade Hampton. Um, there's some phenomenal recipes. Adam does a really beautiful job with plants. We are plant forward and protein particular. So it's really in line with, with what we do, what we believe in. So that is a brief run through of the restaurant. I know we're close on time, so we'd love to open this up to questions from you guys. So, okay. Back over to you, Dennis. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Well, you have to, you have to do the answers, you guys. Yes. Um, um, a lot, there's a lot of concern uh, from folks um, who heard your talk about, well, what happens when you don't have a vegetable? It's not in season, guys. What do you, what do, you do? Do you make, do you use paper mache samples of it or you just pass on that? Well, actually we have a very long growing season here um, in the upstate and we're growing stuff through the year, all every day of the year, there's something growing. So our menus change regularly to keep up with the seasons. Um, but you, that's why you'll see so much variety on our menus is that we're gonna go with what's coming out of the ground right now. Like we don't really have tomatoes on our menu right now, but we will this summer. Yep. <laughs> uh, another question because it came off of, of, of your talk about using organic ingredients um, and that being um, the question was, well, Okay, but you said you aren't certified, your suppliers aren't certified organic because of the, the cost. So the person is asking, uh, gee, why is that? We thought all the government forms were simple and you could get qualified easily. Uh, how much more expensive and time consuming would it be to be, um, to be truly organic certified? That's a great question. I don't have the actual figures in front of me, um, but it, it's... You know, there's a lot to do on a small farm and it's just another thing on the list as well. And for us having that relationship and that full transparency and knowing the growing practices that checks all the boxes for us. Um, I think the certified organic, it's still, it's a great certification, but it, it's just a little bit more difficult for smaller farmers, which we work exclusively with um, to either set time or money aside to, to acquire. So it's, I think a lot of people had that as a long-term goal. Um, and actually, there's a great organization, it's a nonprofit uh, here in town called Feed and Seed, and they are working to help small farmers get GAP certified and go after um, organic certification. So that's a great program um, that's really starting to take off, and hopefully that will enable more small farmers to uh, be able to get the credentials that they want to be able to sell their wares at market. I would think also one of the advantages of, of farm to table would be the freshness of the of the produce or the, or the product itself, it's more likely to be at its prime than you go to the store or grocery store or, or a commercial supplier, I would think. Is that true? Absolutely, yep. And being you know, organic growing practices, um, they don't have as long a shelf life uh, for a lot of the crops. So freshness is, like you, you've got a window you've got to work within. Um, it's not gonna be something that came over on a ship from a country far away uh, and had to ripen on its way. It's something that's, that's picked at its peak freshness and then we use it as soon as we can. Okay. Um, there's a, uh, somebody wants to come see your farm and uh, the only way to do that probably is if they want to work on your farm, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, we'll be opening that up in um, the next few weeks. We're just getting the field prepped right now to have volunteers and uh, waiting for our seeds to come so we can start planting. Well, and, and you and, said another question related to that was, um, first, they, they want the address how to get there. So if you put that on your website, that would, sure. take, that would take care of that. Um, and um, they asked about a road stand. You don't have a road stand, but you do sell some products where we do <laughs> yeah so actually you can almost see it behind you dennis like right behind the bell tower we're we're just beyond that tree line that's where the farm is we're on row ford road uh 790 row ford and you'll okay. see a red umbrella out there uh when we do have excess eggs we do have those for sale um at the at the bottom of the driveway uh and then as produce starts to come in we'll have more available uh and flowers too we did a lot of sunflowers yeah, we did last year a lot of sunflowers and zinnias and we have more planned for this year for the roadside stand and a bigger stand coming so <laughs> be on the um, lookout for that 
Okay. Uh, there is, this is a statement, but it's probably, I think it's worthwhile um, from one of the, one of the uh, viewers. Um, and she says, consumers have to understand that organic food is going to be more expensive than going to the supermarket because the local farmers are not subsidized um, the way larger farms are. I'm not sure what she means about that. Um, I don't know that there's government subsidies. There are some for some farms, of, of, of course, of, of growing, mostly based on having them not grow things to keep the market price of, uh, up. Any comments on her comment? Uh, yeah, sometimes it will be more expensive, um, but that's just because you're using domestic labor um, and, you know, more organic farming practices uh, does cost more. It's usually not a large margin. You know, you're not going to find a lot of farmers around here that are doing the what large scale farms are doing, a lot of corn, soybeans. Um, you will find a lot of specialty stuff that grows really well here, um, some native species, uh, and then, you know, lots of tomatoes and zucchini and all that stuff. It's those, those very familiar um, produce items, they, they just, they taste better uh, when they're, you know, heirloom varietals or different varietals and grown in better soil. So there, there will be an incremental cost difference sometimes, but when you, when you get to understand where the food comes from and the work that goes into it, um, that's kind of, it's part of our mission is connecting people to their food and understanding that. Yeah, yeah this it takes, it's a living. Like there, a lot of the small farmers do not have a lot of employees. I mean, you yeah. just can't afford it. So it's that farmer, you're, you're really paying for, you know, him to do this and maybe or be able, or her, I thought, <laughs> maybe be able to afford um, a laborer or two. So. Also, um, you know, in the in supermarkets, a lot of the fruits in particular um, are, are, are picked when they're quote unquote green. And then, there, then there's a holding process and chemical process in some cases, that 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 item goes goes through before it's put out on the on the grocery shelf because it, it would get damaged um, if it was shipped, you know, ten thousand miles or whatever, you know, to it as well. So there's that aspect as well. Um, there's one question uh, regarding about um, fertilizer versus compost, chemical fertilizer, and so on, as to organically what type of fertilizer is is okay approved or what you use we, we really yeah, don't use any. use any we use compost only um, and then the animals naturally fertilize the soil as well um, we we did put some nitrogen amendments last year uh, but beyond, a little bit of lime yeah, maybe of after lime. our soil test um, Clemson extension analyzed the soil and told us that what we needed to add to the soil so it, we didn't use any fertilizer. Um, you did talk, uh, you showed some of your planted uh, meals that um, Adam prepares. I trust there's also instructions about how you, what you do with them when you get them home. Yep, yep super simple. They're either heat and eat or ready to eat. Um, we want to take all the work out for people so that they can, we know people are busy and got a lot going on, especially now. Um, so it's, it's a way to have uh, delicious, healthier food. Um, and, you know, I forgot to mention, but we do work with Spruce MD, um, Mary Britton Blankenship. She's a physician that advises us on our nutritional content. Um, so we want to be aware of, you know, what's going into the meals, make sure that they're, they're balanced. Uh, so we do uh, work with Spruce to ensure that we have a, a balanced menu coming out each week. You also talked about um, you had a planted meal um, once, once a month type of thing. Yes, we have our, our plant-based supper club. Uh, we, we've continued the tradition. Um, so the, the video that you saw earlier with Nat Bradford and um, John and Adam and John Buck, uh, that will be coming up March 10th. We generally have those on the second Wednesday of each month. Uh, those are all on Eventbrite and on our website. They're on our website. Facebook page, yeah. website. We email them. Like it's really good to sign up for our email list because then you know you get everything that's coming up and we have jazz every night now. Yeah, Thursday There's... through Sunday we have live jazz with Greenville Jazz Collective. And that has been Okay, so if I came if I came to one of your planted meals, would I would I be disappointed because there was not a steak nearby or No. Or, You'll be or, blown or away. Yeah. You, <laughs> you you might look at plants a little different. Yeah, okay. So if and you're so... plant curious, check out our plant-based supper club or even just come experience the menu. We have lots of plant-based options on the menu. 
I saw Wendy and, and Adam do a, um, um, a, a session on planted uh, menu items and Adam brought all this stuff out of uh, various things that he has discovered or uses to sort of fill that gap that you might feel from normal, what you might call normal protein, the taste wise. Yeah. Well, man. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Adam definitely paints with flavor. So yeah. he's, he's a master. And if you're interested in learning about plant-based cooking, we would like to see if there is a demand out there for that. And Wendy, what is that? Uh, it's on YouTube. So what is that? that an interview with uh, Prisma Healthcare? What, what, what? Yes, it was the Cancer Survivors Park. So if you go to the Cancer Survivors Park website, they have their virtual programs listed there. Or if it's on their YouTube channel now, um, but it, it was through the Cancer Survivors Park. And I am a cancer survivor. So it's it was really a great opportunity to be able to talk about um, you know, what that can do for you. Dennis, I'll be happy to send that link to you if you want to include it in the notes beneath the video when you post it. Well, it gets lost, I think. I don't I, so you, you're going to advertise it, I guess. So it'll be on your website, right? Yes. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, from a business perspective now, um, a question uh, regarding um, COVID-19. Uh, uh, you guys uh, didn't know it was coming. Uh, when you started remodeling, <laughs> I didn't when you started remodeling the restaurant, and you you've done a fantastic job as we saw through the walk walkthrough of of uh, really enhancing it and making it very friendly, and well with a lot of interesting things, um, social dining as well opportunities. Your your thousand ton <laughs> table, for example, before COVID was really you got a chance to sit down at a, at a table um, with someone else, perhaps, and you could talk across the table and meet them uh, and, and, what, and whatever. Um, and all of a sudden from going from, I don't know, um, a lunch and dinner and, and a full house and waiting list, it's certainly been troubling. How in the world are you surviving? I think that we're actually fortunate that neither one of us have any restaurant experience. Um, all of our experiences in other industries where we've had to be creative and pivot in different ways. So we took it as, as just a challenge that came our way. Uh, we actually, Adam was nominated for um, James Beard Best Chef Southeast. And then yeah. the next week we had to close. Yeah. And it was um, six months to the day that we opened, but we did everything from fire up the pizza ovens and serve pizza and, it's, it's been a good opportunity, I think, for us as new restaurant owners to really get into the numbers, to really understand our business. And I think it's been a growing opportunity for us. So. Okay. Uh, the other thing that, that's impressed me, um, and you sort of hit on it, um, uh, actually, was um, you sort of have formed uh, relationships with fellow uh, farm to farm to market or farm to table uh, establishments. And I found that very interesting rather than being front row, front coat uh, front and, and, you know, aggressively disking the other person. Uh, you've established really a, a, a group. I've seen uh, a former chef from Husk uh, doing a special cook with Adam and, and so on. And I think that's great um, working together to promote the, this, this concept. Yeah, and honestly, you know, we, we believe a rising tide lifts all boats. Um, and what we're doing is not easy. And if someone else wants to do it, we want to give all the support we can. Uh, because there's such a small margin of people that are putting this kind of effort into their restaurant experience. Um, and so we want to make sure that we support those that, that give that intention. Uh, and that support comes back to us, too. We, um, in December, we were approached by the Anchorage. Um, they had started a uh, nonprofit called Regrow with a anonymous philanthropist and uh, they received money from the CARES grant. And so they invited all local restaurants that are independently owned that source locally to join this program. Um, and it really, it really helped us in a big way. And yeah. we're very thankful for And others that. in the community. Yeah. So it's, so we would, we'd buy from the farmers, uh, we'd prepare everything here and then it would go to people in need. So we work with loaves and fishes, uh, with local churches, schools, schools, it would go home in their backpacks. Like. 
so that it was an amazing program that everyone got to benefit all the way down the line. And it, it was, it was really meaningful to have someone else pull us into something like that. And we just, we believe that what we're trying to do um, can be achieved by others, but it, it takes the support of the community. And we have a few questions about March 10th. Um, people want to know what time is it? It's 6.30, March 10th. Um, we'll kick off and we'll have right. Nat Bradford and John. Yeah. You can make reservations on, online. Yes. Yeah, so it's, uh, we have a link in our bio on Instagram if you're there. Uh, if not, we have this posted on Facebook as well. Um, or if you join our email list on our website, we'll send that out to you as well. Or Eventbrite. It's Eventbrite, you can find it. Yep. You can put Topsoil March into Eventbrite. It'll pop up. And another question about, about March 10th is, uh, is, is it going to be socially distanced? Yes. So we're, we're still operating at half capacity. Um, all of our tables are spaced appropriately. Um, and we're just going to continue with that until everyone feels comfortable. Yeah. I, I don't think we're there yet, but we're certainly you know, doing our part to, to make sure we can infuse some normalcy in this very strange time. Yeah, it feels like a community dinner, but everybody is spaced properly and we have a lot of space so we're fortunate that we have a large restaurant with outdoor dining and uh, there's a, a, a ribeye person who is very anxious uh, to come and have ribeye he, he found ribeye on your menu so he wants to know what is special about your ribeye where does it come from and has it been padded and wh whatever yeah that's a great trail question place. i wish adam was here yeah so it's either from uh, trail place sorry trail place uh, or greenbrier um, those would be the, the likely suspects, uh, but this, that will change regularly too, because right now it, you never know where something's going to come from locally based on demand. So, uh, menu changes weekly. If you guys have questions, feel free to reach out. We're happy to answer those anytime. Right. So I guess that it's, it's indicative that you do have a wide range of, of meals on your, on your menu, but you do keep your menu limited so you can handle it, uh, well. So it's not going to be a 25 page item menu item of listing. It's going to be everything you do. You guys do is special as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. <laughs> well, okay. It's, it's 128. So we ought to say goodbye. We want to thank you very much uh, for the, for thank the you. tour. Thank you guys so much. Great opportunity. Thank you. And be sure you watch yourself on YouTube. Um, <laughs> we on will. Okay. Bye. Bye. Awesome. Thank Good you guys. Have a great day. Yeah. Good Bye. Bye. Bye.